Hey everyone, I have no microphone connected. I don't know what is going on. I have 28% battery. I am trying to get this done before I fly out tomorrow to go to Texas. I'm going to San Angelo, Texas for a beautiful event. It is a women's conference and it's all about spiritual warfare. So I'm going to be talking two times, one about me being clueless about the spiritual war and how I was participating with evil. And then my second talk is going to be about how finally God pulled me out of the pits of hell, gave me eyes to see, and the weapons to fight. But today, Saturday morning coffee with Kendra, which I do not have because it is Friday afternoon. <laughs> I'm just trying to get things done. We're going to review a little bit about the foundations of discernment. So go ahead and watch the video that I did on that because you're going to need to make sure that you have these four things. Number one, you have to say yes to God. Like Mary, give that kind of fiat your whole entire life, your soul, your mind, your body. Number two, support everything with the sacraments of the Catholic Church. This is Jesus's church. He gave us the Eucharist. He gave us reconciliation. He gave us sacraments of baptism and, of course, marriage to support us on this journey. So take full advantage of those. Number three, we must pray. We must reflect. We must go inside our interior castle so that we can truly know God's voice our voice and Satan's voice. Number four, ascesis. Remember that funny word? Self-denial or self-giving. So those four are nothing to mess around with. Those are the foundations of discernment. Now today we're going to get into rule number one and rule number two. And then I'll do two rules every single week, which will get through 14 rules. And that should help you on your journey, at least to clarify a few things on how this whole discernment works and to keep your eyes peeled for the deception of the evil one and how he's going to work in your life. It's actually quite fun to have God open your eyes and to see all the weapons that he gives us and the little peeks into the ways that Satan absolutely lies to us and deceives us every single day. So before we get started on those first two rules, let's remember that Jesus was tempted by Satan. Jesus himself used the word of God, scripture, to shut down the evil one. And that is what we need to do. Why do you think I keep harping on the fact that you need to start mental prayer, which is reflecting on scripture? You need to have God put on your heart what he wants to tell you through that scripture. And you need to believe in the truth of what the scripture is telling you. The truth about the fact that you are a child of God, that you are loved beyond belief, that God created you and knitted you in your mother's womb way before your time, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. There are so many lies that we can dispute just by looking at God's word. So Jesus used it as a defense. So that is really what we have to do when we capture that spirit. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 in a moment. But there are three things that we need to be actively aware of in discernment of spirits. This is Saint Ignatius, and we're reviewing his 14 rules. Number one, we have to be aware. We have to pay attention. This is what I say all the time. We cannot be going through our life in the subconscious programs. We have to pay attention. The battleground is your mind, people. And if we allow our minds just to go wherever, it's Satan's playground. And we have to understand what is happening at the moment. This is why I say, stop, pause, and pray. We have to assess, why am I feeling this way? Is this an overreaction to this person, to this event, to this something? Because if we're not paying attention and we just 
reacted to something disproportionately than we should have, then we have to look at what is really going on right now. That's why it's so important to be aware, but also understand what is happening and then take action. People, I cannot stress enough, your spiritual walk requires you to do something. Don't tell God to guide your feet and then don't move them. That's not how it works. So what you have to do is take action, accept it or reject it. So if that thought brings you closer to God, then embrace it. If it's drawing you to greater selflessness, if it's drawing you to more humility, then run to it. And if it is moving you in the opposite direction and you do not feel like you are going to God, then you just reject that thought in the name of Jesus Christ, always in his name. I reject the thought that I am worthless, that I am fat, that I am ugly, that I'm not smart enough, that I'm not holy enough. And I reject any evil spirit that is attacking me and making me tired and lazy and lethargic and slothful in my prayer life. I reject the lie that God won't speak to me in my prayer, that I won't learn how to pray. And I give myself to you, Lord, humbly. I open my heart, my soul, my mind, my body, and I ask you to fill me with your truth. We have the capability of resetting these programs with God, with Jesus, with Mary, with the Catholic Church, with the sacraments, with the magisterium. We don't go opposite of any of that. We use all of that plus all of the beautiful things in the church, like the sacraments and the saints and our guardian angel and, 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 and. Okay, speaking of scripture, let's read 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. This is so important. We are battling spirits. It's not the flesh, everyone. For although we are in the flesh, we do not battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our battle are not of flesh, but are enormously powerful capable of destroying fortresses. We destroy arguments and every pretension raising itself against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. This is God telling us that we have divine power in the name of Jesus Christ. This is God telling us that we destroy arguments and things against God and against the Catholic Church with, of course, love in our hearts, and we take every thought captive and make them obedient to Christ. So when we have a thought that is not really pure, or it's a thought that might actually lead us to then that movement and that temptation, that near occasion of sin, we capture it and we make it obedient to Christ. No, I will not. I reject in the name of Jesus that thought, that temptation, that lack of temperance. That's what we need to do. And we can do that. That is the walk. That is mental prayer. That is reflecting on scripture. And that is learning the voices in our life so that we can then move in the way that God wants us to move and not in the way that we, our selfish little selves, and Satan want us to move. And let's not forget that we can renew our minds every single day. That's Romans 12. And James 4, 7, if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. And if we run to God, God will run toward us. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to read a couple of the rules. The first two, they're not in any order. They don't rely on one another. A lot of them go back to rule number six, which we will get there soon. But let's just start with rule number one and rule number two. Again, these are discernment of spirit rules by St. Ignatius of Loyola. First rule, in the persons who go from mortal sin to mortal sin, the enemy is commonly used to propose to them apparent pleasures, making them imagine sensual delights and pleasures in order to hold them more and make them grow in their vices and sins. In these persons, the good spirit uses the opposite method, 
pricking them and biting their consciences through the process of reason. Do you remember when I told you that discernment of spirits isn't as simple as like saying, oh, I feel peaceful, so therefore it must be God. This is the very first rule. That does not necessarily mean that that is the case when you are in mortal sin. So you are running from pleasure to pleasure and evil is able to conjure up that peace. God, on the other hand, is the one who is poking and prodding you and making you feel shameful. So let's say it's you having an adulterous affair. You are cheating on your spouse. You have these amazing feelings when you're with that person because it's all new and you have this exciting attraction and it's all secretive. But at the same time, you have guilt and shame. I hope at least. <laughs> That's if God is pro probing you. If you have no guilt and you have no shame, then we have a completely different situation. Then you are absolutely over here on the other side of the playing field where evil resides. But if you have both, okay, I'm doing this bad thing, but I feel bad about it and you have some regret and you have some conscious poking, that is God. So you have the devil and the angel, right? You have the devil and God. That's kind of what we're talking about here. This is the first rule. So mortal sin, you do not find peace in doing those activities and doing those actions. As a matter of fact, when you find peace, you can realize that that's Satan and his minions wanting to keep you in that sin so that you do not go toward God. That's his number one and only focus is to suck your soul down to hell. Okay, the second rule, this is for the person who's trying to be good. Maybe you just found God and you had an encounter. Maybe you just came back to the church and you're kind of learning the teachings, what this God thing is all about. The second rule, in the persons who are going on intensely cleansing their sins and rising from good to better in the service of God our Lord, it is the method contrary to that of the first rule. For then it is the way of the evil spirit to bite, sadden, and put up obstacles, disquieting with false reason that one may not go on. And it is proper to the good to give courage and strength, consolations, tears, inspirations, and quiet easing and pulling away all obstacles that one may go in well doing. Okay, so this is the opposite. If you're trying, if you're trying to be good and you're trying to live by the teachings and you're learning and you're being humble and you're going to confession and you're doing your best to create a relationship with God, then you are going to have encouragement and courage and consolations and you're going to have feelings and emotions and things like that that are going to keep you coming back to God. Remember James 4, 7, if you flee from the devil, the devil will flee. If you run toward God, God will run toward you. So let's use the same adultery situation. If you decide that you are going to focus on your marriage, you are going to have encouragement. You're going to have support. You're going to have God pushing you toward fixing and mending that marriage. And at the same time, you're probably going to have Satan out there and maybe part of yourself wanting that excitement, that secret, that lust, and everything that you think you're going to miss and never have in your current marriage, which is a bunch of bunk. Those are lies too. The evil one wants you to think that there's no way you're going to have an amazing marriage that's filled with wonderful intimacy through the marital act, but also through so much more. That is a lie. And we have to go again back to scripture. But we won't for this particular situation. That's something that I want you all to do on your own. You can go do a search on 
Bible verses supporting marriage. And you can go find out what God says about marriage. All right, everyone, I am going to go over to the Soul, Mind, and Body membership group. You can join right here below by clicking join. And I want to share with you guys a little bit about this talk that's coming up and the difference between participating in the spiritual battle and not participating in the spiritual battle and how huge it is in your life. So I'll see you over in the membership group. If not, I will see you back here next time. Find something more with God, soul, mind, and body, and have a blessed and inspired day. I finally found something